Hello and welcome back to Pictorial on Relay FM. I'm Quinn Rose and I did not go to art school, but I still love learning about art all the time. And I'm Betty. I also didn't go to art school, but of course I love learning about art. So today we are talking about the story behind the painting that has been sometimes called the African Mona Lisa. It's called Tutu. And it set the record for the most expensive art sale of a modern Nigerian art piece in history uh, so far at $1.6 million. So I'm going to tell you the story about what this painting is and who the artist was and how it was missing for decades. Um, But just to start off, I have sent you the image of this painting, and I was wondering if you could react to it, maybe even describe it for the audience who aren't looking at it right now. Okay, so it is a portrait, and it's in portrait uh, mode. (laughs) Phones have broken our brains. It's a portrait that is a portrait. (laughs) So, and it is of a woman who seems to be looking far off into the distance. And she appears to be black. And she is um, wearing, um, I think, I don't know if I would call like like a headdress or a turban type of uh, headpiece. And she seems to have like a quite a slender neck and then she's wearing a what looks like fabric draped over her shoulders although I'm not sure if it's just like a dress or something that's that's got a lot of folds and fabric Um, and it seems to be blue and white and it looks kind of silky but the whole picture is like dark in terms of lighting it seems like it's like a dimly lit picture and I would say the style is like realistic representation, but the brush strokes are kind of loose. And then in the background, it seems like it's backlit. There's like a bit of glow in the background, and the background is just like a blurry, glowing background. <laughs> Does this painting remind you of any other paintings that you've seen? Well, I don't know if like my mind got clouded by earlier when you said some people call it the African Mona Lisa. Like I can definitely see like this is a type of portrait. Like the connections I can make to it is the someone who has a pretty neutral expression similar to the Mona Lisa. And it does have this like triangular kind of composition similar to it, even though the Mona Lisa is like much zoomed out, you see more of the body. But I would say other than that, I don't immediately think of anything else. That's very interesting. I was wondering if you would name um, Girl with a Pearl Earring because this painting is uh, framed in quite the same way. Like the subject of the painting is also somewhat turned away from the viewer and also is looking over her left shoulder, which is very similar to the way that the subject is framed in Girl with a Pearl Earring. As As a foundation, I just wanted to see if what sort of influences you were picking up on well we are going to get back into all of that and all of the sort of artistic elements of this painting but first i'm going to take a step back and talk about the artist um so this was painted by a man named ben onwanwu and he is just like the most successful nigerian artist ever like one of the famous <laughs> one of the most famous artists out of the entire continent of africa like there's a crater named after him on mercury so to talk a bit about his background anwanwu was born in um 1917 um so he was an artist like all through the 20th century basically um he didn't pass away until 1994 um and he was active till the end of his life so uh his body of work like spans a really long time he started art fairly early in his life um his father was actually a sculptor and so pr- he pretty much inherited being a sculptor like right away Um, But then in the 1940s, when he was in his 20s, he had the opportunity to study fine arts. And he, along with four other students who are kind of collectively known as the Murray School, um, were the first group of Nigerian students trained in European, like, artistic techniques by the British colonial government. Uh, So he has a really interesting sort of background where he um, is trained in the these, like, colonialist European fine arts and was one of the first Nigerian artists to be trained um, in that, which is why like 
you can see when he pulls um, influence from like Renaissance painters and uh, other kinds of these artworks. But he's also talked extensively about how like he doesn't say that he's influenced by European artists because like he's talked to European artists. European artists are influenced by African artists. Like it is. <laughs> yeah. He's just returning the cycle home. <laughs> I feel like when I study a lot of artists, they're quite often, especially if they're if they're portrait or if they paint figures, they're quite often sculptors as well as painters. Like I think some people seem to think, oh, someone is a sculptor or they're a painter. And sometimes it's like, yeah, someone, somebody does more of the other. But like whether you're talking about like Michelangelo or Henry Moore, like a lot of these people who are um, known for one or the other, they, they do both. And I do think that being able to understand a three-dimensional form like it sounds obvious but it's like sometimes you don't think about it that of course being having that sculpture uh, sculptural training in 3d then you would be much better at representing it on a two-dimensional plane oh yeah and he continued creating art as a sculptor and in other mediums um throughout his life like he did not just like switched to painting and was like, this is it now, everybody. <laughs> yeah. um, in fact, like some of his most famous pieces are his sculptures um, before he made uh, this painting. We're not we're not there yet. But um, even <laughs> in the like decades before he made this painting, um, he was chosen by the Queen of England to sculpt her portrait uh, in 1956, which actually was like pretty funny because he was like actively engaged in anti-colonial movements. And then Queen Elizabeth was like, that guy could sculpt me. So that's interesting. <laughs> but but he sculpted her um, and he uh, the queen sat for him about a dozen times um, and the sculpture was completed in 1957. Um, and then about 10 years later in 1966, uh, he actually finished this uh, bronze sculpture of this figure. And this was for the United Nations in New York. And it is still on display at the United Nations. So he's he's got some pretty high profile sculptures, especially of sort of like people and like humanoid figures um, all over the world, really. <laughs> well, among all of this work that he was doing, um, as I talked about, like he was trained in like Western art techniques. And he also uh, he also like extensively studied African techniques. And he was one of the pioneering people to create um, African modernism. And he was like the first African artist to be internationally recognized as a, like, high-achieving contemporary artist, which, I mean, we all know why there's not that many. Um, and it's not because the artists in Africa are amazing. It's because the world is deeply, deeply racist. But I'm I'm trying not to get... I don't want to get too negative about anything. Like, I just want to, like, talk about how awesome this guy is and, like, how cool his work is. So, like, I'm not going to get into that. But among, like, obviously a lot of, like, really messed up stuff about the way that artists are talked about and everything that he had to deal with in his life, the work that he made was amazing. And along the way, he talked and wrote a lot about his position as an African artist and the way that he existed in the wider art world. And he like really recognized what his place was in that and was really proud of the way that he was able to open doors for a lot of artists um, who were younger than him because he almost single-handedly, it seems like, sort of legitimized the idea of like being a Nigerian artist and pursuing that as a career and a, and a passion. I think the parallel that I can personally draw is a, a while ago when we spoke about, I think, the Canadian artist Carl Beam, his success and achievement, a, a lot of people, and he probably personally believed, was that he was one of the first, and if not the first, Canadian Indigenous artist to be known as, like, primarily as a contemporary artist like that's a that's an internationally renowned contemporary artist and that his uh, painting was the first one that made it to the national galleries contemporary wing and not the indigenous wing and but mm -hmm. the interesting thing is like his topics are about his culture and heritage um, as somebody who grew up under uh, who grew up as a indigenous person but there's mixtures of colonialism in his work so like it's he's not like actively rejecting his 
own culture or anything. But at the same time, it's like really like the the goal of a lot of these artists, um, as far as I know anyway, is to reach an international audience, is that they want to be known as a contemporary artist, uh, like before anything else usually but but at the same time they're like but of course my inspirations and a lot of like my work is about like me and and what i experienced and or like my my cultural history and things like that so like i i feel like impersonally that's how i frame it in a like not necessarily negative way but like even though obviously there's problems um like why it took this long for artists like these to get recognized but yeah, I think the whole aspect of like being recognized specifically as a contemporary artist and having your work be recognized as part of like the modernist movement um in in uh in Wanwu's case um is a big part of this uh, because of the way like especially with indigenous peoples but also but also with African peoples as well is just like the really active propaganda in in lots of countries about how like these cultures are like less advanced or or even that these people don't exist anymore and they're historical. And it's just like the amount of propaganda that an artist has to break through in order to be seen at all and especially to be recognized as someone like that is both like, of course, like informed by their culture and traditions, the way that every single human being is, and also is a contemporary artist who is groundbreaking in their field, is just an ongoing battle. But as I think is very clear, like Anwanu was extremely successful in his lifetime, which is always awesome to see. Um, and one of the things that he did a lot was having sort of positions at various universities and institutions and things. And from 1971 to 1975, he was a professor of fine arts at the University of il Efe. And this is when he met the subject of this painting. Um, and so the this woman, her name was actually um, Ade Tutu, but she was Tutu for short. And she was actually a princess. She was the granddaughter of a former ruler um, of the city. And she actually caught his eye um, just like out and about because he thought she was so beautiful. And she's, he specifically noted like her long neck um, as an aspect of her beauty, which I thought was so funny that you picked up on in the painting that she has like a very slender neck um, because that was one of the things that he noted specifically. And he basically like went to her and her family and he was like, hey, like, can I do a portrait of you? And they're like, I don't know. I don't know. And this is not as simple as it sounds um, because this is happening in uh, the early 1970s. And this is right after Nigeria's civil war, um, which was 1967 to 1970. Um, and obviously... As with all wars, there was a lot going on that we're not going to get into. This is extremely broad brushstrokes. But what's important um, and relevant for this particular story is that Nwanmu um, is a member of, of an ethnic group known as the Ibu. And uh, the subject of the painting, Tutu, is a member of an ethnic group named uh, the, the Yorubans. And they were on opposite sides of this civil war. So uh, there was... A lot of distrust of him when he was uh, questioning if he could paint this woman, but her family did allow it, um, and she sat for these paintings, and he created this portrait of her. He act he considered it his masterpiece, um, and it became a symbol of reconciliation in Nigeria, like this beautiful traditional portrait of this beautiful royal woman that was painted by someone uh, who was on the quote unquote like opposite side only a few years previously, and then of course like. It's a really good painting. And so this not only became a symbol of reconciliation, it's incredibly, incredibly popular in Nigeria. There was actually a quote that um, Chimamanda Adichie, uh, who is this author, um, she was giving an interview in 2013 and she brought up this painting and she was like, every middle class family in Nigeria had a print of this painting hanging on their wall. Like it's just it it, it, it is just like ubiquitous um, in Nigeria. That's so interesting. So <laughs> to this just reminded me of something and uh, not to kind of like 
this stretch it to tie it back to our last episode or anything <laughs> i don't want to tell too much of it's kind of a personal story but um i recently learned that a member of my family who is no longer alive um who was alive during world war Two, like had their life saved by a japanese soldier so I, my family is chinese and obviously or not obviously some people don't realize that there's there's racial tensions between Chinese and Japanese um, people, not everybody, but like to this day because of World War Two, and, uh, and some people are obviously like, what? Like they, they fought on opposite sides of World War Two, <laughs> so, but I'm like, it's okay if people are only aware of European World War Two history. But I, I'm obviously very much aware, and um, and and honestly, like this story, I think is the one of the reason why, like my family specifically don't have any antagonism towards Japanese people. And I'm not saying that everybody needs a story like this to get over like racial hatred. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that like this, these stories and these connections, like, obviously, I'm like, of course, there are like, hu- like humane soldiers in a war and people who, of course, would save the life of a child on the other side. But like, you don't, he- that's not the story you hear. Like when you talk to families who have fought in the war, they're like, oh, no, my enemies were trying to kill me. And that's why I hate them. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> Well, I think that that points to the way that these kind of symbols can be so important, like, especially in cases of war and civil war and these kinds of conflicts where there is so much going into like trying to make you hate the other side and distrust the other side and things like a personal story that that paint a different picture or like literally a differently painted picture can have incredible potency in in getting over some of those aspects. So as I said before, Anwanu considered this his masterpiece um, and he did not want to sell it. He had a a problem like selling a lot of pieces because they were so precious to him. Um, So he created prints of them, which, as I said, are basically all over Nigeria. And he also painted two more versions of it um, and sold those so that he didn't have to part with the original. Very sadly, um, in 1994, like shortly before he passed away, uh, his house was broken into and the painting was stolen. So just absolute tragedy. This painting was stolen. It hasn't been seen since. Um, Well, it's been seen by somebody, but like (laughs) the wider world still does (laughs) not know where the original is. Meanwhile, there are those other two versions, which have also been lost. Wow. Uh, And the second tutu uh, was last seen in 1975 at an exhibition at an Italian embassy. Um, but then it disappeared and, and hasn't been seen since. Now, here's where this story gets really fun. So there is a man named uh, Giles Papiot, who is the director of African art at Bonhams um, in the UK. And he has spent decades trying to find these paintings, uh, just decades. And he, like... A lot of people have brought him prints of things and whatever, and it's never been the real thing. And then he got this tip that there it might be in this place, right? He goes to what he describes as a modest apartment in North London in, like, late 2017, and it's just on the wall. Like, <laughs> it's on Wanwu's to-do, the second version. It's just on the wall. <laughs> the wow. family had no idea. It was just, like, a thing... The painting had been in their family for a couple decades. They just hung it on the wall. They were like, they had no idea like who painted it, how valuable it was. Wow. The the art director was on the floor. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, <laughs> this so is wild. The, the, the family who had it has uh, remained anonymous, so we don't know who they are. It's obviously pretty suspicious that this um priceless african painting has ended up in this random apartment in london <laughs> the the people who had at the time said that like oh like i don't know where it came from like my dad bought it from somebody it it kind of seems like the people who had it in the end were just like oh i whew, we i don't know we just have had this we liked it <laughs> yeah, i was on yeah. the wall i don't know <laughs> and they didn't know like where it came from and they clearly they, like they didn't know who the artist was or how valuable it was i suspect if they did know how valuable it was it would not they would not have just been like oh uh, <laughs> 
And so then this painting was sold at auction and it sold for 1.2 million pounds or over 1.6 million dollars, which, as I said at the beginning, is the most expensive modernist Nigerian painting ever. In my opinion, should have been sold for more. But I mean, I don't have that much money, but yeah, I I, I couldn't figure out who bought it. Like I kept trying to figure like nobody says who bought it. It has been on display in Nigeria since then. So that's great. It wasn't just like somebody like bought it and then hit it. <laughs> or, <laughs> right, uh, right. So it was in display in 2019 at the RX Lagos exhibition in Nigeria. And so at least it's like out there now. And at least it's being like shown in Nigeria and not just like in like France or something, some random art <laughs> collectors. Um, so that's nice. I don't know where it is currently. Um, there is a pandemic, so who knows where it is? <laughs> but I assume somebody knows where it is because I feel like they're going to keep really careful track of it now. <laughs> well, I, I keep thinking, I have a couple of comments, but the thing I keep thinking of is this painting should have had an NFT. <laughs> I'm oh like, my God. obviously, obviously not necessarily the nature of an NFT right now, a more sustainable one where it can be tracked that you if it had a contract where you can just pull up its provenance and be like, oh, look, these are all the people that have owned it. Obviously, this still doesn't prevent somebody from stealing a painting. They should just put one of those um, like tile trackers on the back of the frame. Stick it out on there. Yeah. RFID tag. <laughs> The thing that it really actually ma makes me think of, and the reason why I say, like, I'm actually kind of surprised it only sold for 1.6 million because there's a similar story, which I'm so sorry I have to tie it back to the place I work almost every single time, but this is where I get most of my art experience. But um, at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, our most prized possession, like our like our quote unquote crowning jewel is the massacre of the innocents by Peter Paul Rubens. And people usually get really mad about this painting and how expensive it was when this person bought it in 2001. So this Canadian businessman called Ken Thompson bought this piece, Massacre of the Innocents by Rubens, for $49.5 million, which is equivalent wow. to $117 million Canadian dollars in 2001. So like this was... 20 years ago so like that it's it, even just tracking inflation it, it, it would be I, like I don't know how much but a lot more than 117 million so but the thing is like obviously as an as a public instit art institution we didn't buy it it was donated by Ken Thompson uh, so when he purchased it he purchased it he purchased it anonymously so nobody knew who bought Rubens's uh, uh, painting until it was later donated to, to us. And I believe he was still alive when it was revealed that it was him, but then he died shortly after. So uh, anyway, like he didn't want people to know that it was him. And so the reason or the primary reason this Rubens painting sold for, at the time it actually broke the record for most expensive painting ever sold. It's since been broken, but it, it was because most Rubens pieces were, uh, and he's like a really famous uh, like artist from the Dutch golden age, there was like no new Rubens is to be discovered, it, it, except for one that had been lost in the 1700s, is somewhere in Vienna, it was last seen, and then just nobody knew where it was. That's why when it went for auction, it was like, super, like sought after and people were, you know, people were fighting over it. And that's one of the reasons it became so uh, like it sold for almost 50 million pounds. So and it was I think at the time, Ken Thompson was the richest person in Canada. So th that makes sense why he was like one of the few people in the world who can afford this. But again, I am thankful like for the fact that Ken Thompson's decision was, yeah, like I'm going to display it at a pu public art institution. I mean, the context of how much money this sold for uh, is more clear when you know that like at this particular sale that this uh, painting was purchased at, um, there were like 20 other Manu artworks um and so like this this man had a lot of work and like some of the other paintings that were sold there were sold for like hundred and fifty thousand dollars and so like obviously that's a lot of money but it's not 1.6 million dollars kind of money and so this value is so high because it's considered his masterpiece but also because it disappeared and that actually 
brings me all the way to my very final little fun fact about this, which is another one of Nwanu's paintings that was lost before, like, showed up again. Not one of the tutus, um, but a painting called Christine uh, about, uh, uh, like, the next year was discovered. Or, no, sorry, I think in 2019 um, was discovered this painting called Christine. It was another portrait um, of another woman, actually. And once that was recovered and identified um, as as a, a, an authentic and one move painting, it sold for $1.4 million at auction. <laughs> and so I personally, like, this gives me hope that the other tutus may still be found. Um, and it's great to see, like... Anwanwu's son, Oliver, is actually also a painter and galleryist um, who is, like, actively maintaining his father's legacy through the Ben Anwanwu Foundation. Um, and he has spoken a lot about the sort of increased visibility that his father's work has gotten in the past few years with the recovery of these two paintings um, and with, obviously, like, the increased value that's been placed on them by people buying these works as they are coming back into the public eye. And so it's obviously, like, really exciting for him and his family and for all of Nigerian artists, honestly, and having this greater spotlight shown on them. And also all of this stuff happening, like, personally gives me hope that they will recover the other two tutus someday. And, like, maybe, like, all three of them could be brought back together. I think that would be amazing if it ever happens. I now want to, once there is not a pandemic anymore, which we'll see when that's going to happen, I would love to be able to see this artist's work like you know, just just more than these uh, these few works that I've now looked up, because like I I love just seeing you know a retrospective of any artist's work. But I think yeah, if we you can get these works all together in one room, that would also be super significant. Not just in terms of like oh it's been recovered, but I think now knowing that there is a a story that actually makes a connection among people of Nigeria and that this actually is much more meaningful probably to someone there than it is to someone else who is isn't aware of the context like I think that would just be that would be amazing we honestly barely scratch the surface of this artist today as we so often do there's just so much to talk about with these really great these really great artists and so we can only ever do little slices of them um but this was a very fun story to dive into i also should have said at the beginning um i learned about this and this particular story from the book black futures um which is this amazing anthology book and so also like i highly recommend reading uh the book black futures um which has information about this particular painting but also like tons and tons of like other uh, black artists and activists and like all the good stuff read the book it's amazing this is not the first time we talked about our artworks being sold for a lot of money and i do think like every time we do like when things are in the millions there is an aspect to it where some people are like you know why is our why are artworks like so expensive and we don't have to get back into that topic again but the thing i do think is interesting is that while there are people who are like using art as an investment, there are a lot of people who just really like a painting and that there is a personal connection that they have to it. And that very often actually like among wealthy people, these, these types of things are an emotional purchase. And like when people think about, you know, like why are, are like, why would someone like pay that much money for something um, other than just they have too much money? And really, it could, it really could be like, you know, you, you can't put a value or it's difficult to put a value on, on like how much, something means to you and then for some people it's just like well it's worth as much as I can afford and there is another piece that, that I've made a video about where it is a artwork that has a deep connection to Toronto and that it also was a piece that sold for over four million that a lot of people are like oh my god like wh why and how and you know it, it's it's just a painting of a rainbow but I'm like well you don't know what it means to the LGBTQ community of this city and only really those of us who kind of grew up in this environment does. That's what, why some people are like, this painting to us is priceless, but maybe to someone else it's like, it's just a painting. And that's why I think here it's like maybe to like to me, really, I looked at it and I'm like, oh, this is a pa beautiful painting of a beautiful woman. And yeah, like I would probably pay a lot of money for it. Buy a lot of money for me, it's like, 
two hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> so, but to someone else, it means so much more. Well, thanks everybody for listening to this episode of Pictorial. As we wrap up here, I want to tell you about another show on Relay FM you might like, and that is Automators. It is a podcast all about how to automate your devices and automate your life. And so all the time that you spend doing all these little tasks several times a week or maybe even every day, that's time you could be getting back by automating all the things in your life to work for you. It's hosted by David Sparks and Rosemary Orchard, and they know so much about this stuff. It is incredible. Automation is actually something I'm super interested in. It's not something I'm very good at. Like I use things like Zapier and IFTTT to try to automate my life. And um, and I just found out recently that my boyfriend actually listens to automators. I think he saw me on uh, something and then he was like, oh, do you know Rosemary Orchard? And I was like, Yes. And he was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. So it's not just me uh, and Quinn. It's also uh, my someone I live with also would vouch for listening to this show. So if you want to make your devices do more for you, you can go to relay.fm slash automators or just search for automators wherever you get your podcasts. You can find our show notes at relay.fm slash pictorial, or you can find us on Twitter or Instagram at pictorial pod. You can also find me on Instagram at aspiring robot FM. And you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Articulations V. And I am also on YouTube as Articulations. Speaking of YouTube, we also upload these podcast episodes to YouTube, usually a few weeks after the release of the audio versions. So you can go to the Pictorial YouTube channel to watch and look at this beautiful painting as we talk about it. Thanks for listening, our enthusiasts.